one more. Welcome everyone there we go. to the we got it um, to the fourth installment of the Division of Learning Services Lunchtime Hot Topics Hour. Uh, Brad Noonswander is on the road today, so filling in for him. And if you've joined us in the past, you know that we essentially move through uh, a series of presentations on a single PowerPoint, which is what we are going to do today. I think that PowerPoint is has five discrete sections. Uh, and if you have questions, you can email them. Is that correct, Brian? You can email them to us. Uh, you have that, that address, uh, lunchtime. And uh, we could, we'll try our best to answer those in real time during the presentation if possible, or we can get back to you. So with that, I'm going to start off with Jeanette Nobo, who is the Assistant Director for the Career Standards and Assessment Services team. And I'll hand it to you, Jeanette. Great. Uh, this is Jeanette Novo, and it's great to be with you once yeah. again. Um, they've asked us to put these pictures up there, which is kind of scary, but <laughs> at least that's who I am if you haven't seen me before, and I'm glad to be with you once again. Um, I want to provide you this time with an update on the standards. So I want to begin with the purpose of the content standards, and really that is about the what of educational learning. It's what the students should know and be able to do. We write standards to address all students and they serve really as a guideline for schools. There are not really mandates, although when I say that many people do laugh. Um, they also provide direction for the state assessment. The standards are not the how. It's not how schools need to be implementing uh, the standards uh, in, their, in their classrooms. It is not about curriculum, and it's, it is not the curriculum, and it's not the instruction, although those do um, are decided by the teacher as well as um, by the school in terms of the curriculum and instruction. We divide our standards work into four categories for our standards, and those are our assessed standards, our model standards, our essential elements, and then the Kansas career clusters and pathways. All of these content standards are important regardless of the category. We just use those to divide them so that you can know uh, in which category they fall, and they provide for the education of the whole child. The next three slides to list the standards uh, developed and reviewed by KSDE, and we start off with the assessed model standards. And I'm not going to read the slide because you'll be able to have those, but on one side we have the assessed standards, on the other side we have our model standards. The next slide shows you which are the essential elements, and these are linked into um, with the assessed content standards, and these essential elements are what is used for the dynamic learning maps, the DLM. And then, of course, we have our Kansas, uh, Kansas Career Clusters and Pathway, which we have 16 of. These differ from our standards uh, in terms of our assessed and our model standards that we mentioned before because they work in terms of competencies and are more prescriptive for uh, courses and classrooms. Next, I'm going to go through quickly the standards development process of each of these. Um, again, I'm not going to read all the slides, but just point out some highlights uh, since the PowerPoint is up on the website. On this slide, what I want to really mention in terms of the important thing is that they are reviewed every five to seven years and that it's done by a committee. Uh, KSDE staff do not develop these standards by themselves. Um, we approximately have 25 members on the committee, and these committees are divided into a writing and a review committee. Our first meeting is usually a face-to-face -face meeting, with others being then um, through webinars or online. The next three slides have more in-depth detail of the process, which you can take some time later on and look at more closely for your convenience. So slide 11 describes a little bit more about the committee. And then the next slide, slide 12, tells about the um, process when they go to the board. 
Here we have the developmental process for the uh, essential elements. Although part of a consortium, our content consultants are still involved in this process as well. The contact for this is Deb Matthews. And on this slide, there's a link to the DLM website where you can find the essential learnings. These next um, slide has the development process for the Kansas Career Clusters Pathway. Here, this is a five-year process, also done by a committee. And in these committees, business and industry partners are included as well. Then we have the next three slides, which will show you the standards timelines. This first uh, slide is a standards timeline for uh, those standards that are going to be reviewed this coming year. We have our ELA, driver's ed, fine arts, health, library media, math, and physical education and world language standards all being reviewed this coming year. Our lead consultants are, le are listed as, la as well as the last adopted year for these standards. Next is our list of our other standards that are to be reviewed um, in the future, uh, beginning probably in 2017 through 2020. Next, we have our standards review timeline for our career clusters pathway. As you can see, those are the 16 clusters, the lead consultants, when they were last reviewed, and when they will be reviewed again um, in this coming future. Uh, and then if you have, I know I've gone through this fairly quickly, um, but we do have five other presentations and many of them might take a little bit longer in time. So for expediency purposes, um, please don't hesitate to call us for any further information. Here is our contact or my contact information. And if you need to speak to anyone with regard to the essential standards or the uh, clusters pathway, I'll be happy to transfer you when I get the call or try to answer them as I am available to. Um, any questions, don't forget to email us at lunchtime at ksd.org and we'll be glad to answer those or send some information to you later on through a QA. and a um, Next, I believe we have um, John Baranski. All right, thank you. Um, my name is John Bransky, and I'm uh, on the report card development team here at KSDE. And today I'm going to talk a little bit about the new 2015 Kansas building report card and some of the visual and usability enhancements that you can expect to see when we launch in mid-December. All right. Okay. So. What, one thing you'll certainly notice with the new report card is the, the navigation is going to be much more natural. Um, um, if you've used the old report card, you, you'll notice that there was a lot of uh, kind of clicking back and forth and there were some defaults that were defined for you. Um, with the new report card, you're simply, the first page you're going to go to is uh, an entry page uh, with a search filter. And the search filter uses, it utilizes autofill technology. So you can simply just begin typing in all are part of the name of a, a building or a district number or building number, and it'll automatically populate a list below that uh, text box. And then once you select that, you can hit search, and that'll take you into the new report card. Um, we also have uh, geolocation search. And this, this is going to allow you to type in a street address and then define a radius. And once you do that, you can click search, and it'll, it will build a list of um, buildings that are within the radius that you selected. And we use uh, uh, Google Maps geolocation API to, to facilitate that. Once you, and also in addition to that, we will have classic search options, um, the, the ability to search by county, the ability to actually search through a list of, of districts and see what buildings are a part of those districts, and also search by KSBE district as well. Um, Metro navigation and tile UI. So once you uh, begin your search and you go into the actual application, you'll notice that we have a very easy to use tiled layout where we have um, each content area, each reporting section or dashboard, um, we'll have a tile for it and you simply just click on that and it will take you into that dashboard for the entity that you selected. Okay, also um, one the, the approach we took with the new report card was really a mobile first 
uh, we focused on that. So this is a this slide represents a mobile view. So when you go into the report card, uh, it's it's very friendly to to <clears throat> tablets, uh, mini laptops, or uh, or even phones. So um, all of those devices can work with the new report card. All right. Uh, so with the new report card, there's th there's going to be a number of uh, new interactive features. Um, we have a charting tool called AM Chart. It's a JavaScript charting tool that uh, is very powerful and robust. And um, in that first export section of this slide, you'll see that um, I've clicked the uh, the action icon for the chart, and we have the ability to download the chart as an image. We have the ability to actually save the data that comprises the chart. Um, we have a really cool feature called annotation, which I'll describe here in just a second. And then you have the ability to simply print it. Um, we have there's some tables within the report card that that have uh, has quite a bit of data. So we have a keystroke search uh, ability for any of those data tables where um, you'll go to that page and just simply start typing in uh, your to filter the results of that table, and it will automatically every time you type a key, it'll start filtering the results that are in that table. Um, and with the data tables, you also have the ability to, of course, uh, uh, print or download those. And um, the, the ability to page back and forth between uh, between data is very, very fast. Um, value lines. So the charts that are in the, the AM charting tool allows for a very interactive experience where um, as you cursor over the chart, it will actually highlight very, highlight very precisely where you are on the chart. On the uh, on the uh, x and y axis, and it'll also populate. I don't have this on the slide, but it'll populate the legend and show exactly the numbers that you're hovering over in the legend at that given point in time. And the legend also allows you to click on data points and either show them or hide them. So it's really really great. It's a really great tool. And then annotation. This one's particularly cool. You're able to click annotations from the action menu. Um, you can choose a color. And then you can just begin to draw on the chart using only your browser. You don't need any sort of thick client to download, nothing like that. Just a Chrome, IE, or Firefox work perfectly fine. Um, and what's great about this is if you're ever doing a presentation uh, to a, a local school board or something like that, you have the ability to just bring up a browser and start highlighting data points. And you even have the ability to save those annotations and uh, export them as PDF, and it'll retain everything that you highlighted during that presentation. Okay, and so we also have some new visualizations. Um, we in the previous report card we had presented our, our C11 and uh, C12 metrics, which are post-secondary enrollment and post-secondary retention, um, and those were posted as Excel documents. In the new report card, we're actually going to uh, have the ability to go ahead and visualize that same data. And then we've also added for uh, demographic data, we've added some demographic trending. So we can see how demographics have changed over the course of time. And that's, that's really all I have. If you have any questions about the report card, we plan on launching in mid-December. Um, and if you have questions, my email's up on the screen. Feel free to, um, feel free to email me. Appreciate it. And we'll be uh, transitioning over to Mr. Bagshaw. Hey, thanks. I want to give you just a, a brief overview of where we are with uh, educator evaluation, particularly with Keep Keep 2. Uh, many of you who are Keep users and even maybe some of you who aren't uh, know that we started this process about two years ago and we've uh, created a new product, a new tool uh, in, that's in place this year for the first time. And so while we're transitioning, we just uh, affectionately refer to it as Keep 2, where next spring We'll take the old information offline after you've had a chance to capture all that data that you want, and we'll be back to we'll just keep. So for now, we're talking about keep two because we have the two systems there, one with the archived information uh, done previously, and then, um, of course, keep two is current information. It, who's that? Here we go. Here we go. Star Wars trailer coming up. Right? All right. Um, Okay, so it's really important to remember this, and we tell people this all the time, and sometimes people forget, and that's understandable. There are two pieces associated with the educator evaluation. One is the authenticated web application, which is the process by which you log in. You create a username and a password, and it gives you access through the portal 
to take you to keep two keep two keep two obviously is the evaluation tool so any questions or any issues you have toward uh, geared towards just signing in and having access um, if you flip screens here um, here is some information contact the help desk that is only for um, any issues about logging in and signing in beyond that then you'll go to um, to our department and we'll help you with the keep to application the second portion uh, oh also this is a good thing you can go back to that go to the forward there you go thanks Nick um, we have this posted on our website and I thought I would put this up here so you would have it uh, we have educators who are registering all the time because they previously were not in cycle to be evaluated and now they are so if you need a, a quick little cheat sheet for registering uh, this one page document will will tell you how to do that um, or if you call the help desk certainly we'll walk you through that um, the roles that you would actually um, register for once you log in will be these there's a, a very distinct purpose for each of these and when a teacher goes in and registers for KEEP, they are automatically approved. And the reason for that is we didn't want to have a lot of busy work for superintendents or assistant superintendents to have to go in and literally approve everybody in the district. That would be really problematic for districts that have 1,000 plus teachers, and certainly we have a number of those districts. So they're automatically approved. Anyone with an administrative right is approved by us at KSDE, and we can easily verify I think sometimes it's taken us as long as 45 minutes to approve somebody once they've they've asked for access and then we're ready to go. But these are the categories of users that you might want to um, consider if you're looking for a, a username and access in the future. So these are two really good slides to keep and would save you a lot of headache in trying to figure out who to ask. So those are a good resource for you. Um, the Keep tool itself, basically it collects all the evidence and artifacts related to the instructional practice of an educator and when we're talking about educators now we're talking as you know about classroom teachers and building leadership who are evaluated uh, in much the same way where prior to this year uh, we were talking about um, only classroom teachers and so this tool will allow you to, to uh, document all that evidence and artifacts related to the instructional practice and also include the student growth component um, which, by the way, has always been required to be part of the evaluation system by statute. It's just that it was never addressed nearly to, um, to, to the degree that it is now. But all that information uh, is in there. One of the uh, more, I think, satisfying parts of the Keep to tool is that the way it's laid out, we have a lot fewer questions from Keep districts simply because the process is laid out and many questions are answered. And certainly, understandably, those districts who don't use KEEP will have questions because they're using a system that operates just a little differently. And that's okay, but um, I think it's worthy of, of, of paying attention to some of this, if nothing else, just to see uh, what it is the process looks like when you're talking about combining instructional practice data and student growth uh, data. Um, just a couple of quick facts before we wrap up on this topic today. We have approximately 400 or 4,500 users uh, spanning 104 districts currently using KEEP for their evaluation. Um, uh, right now, those are people who are in cycle to be evaluated. This tool will provide um, any district who is interested to upload their own custom rubric. So if you're a school district, who you've created your own evaluation system, but you don't have an electronic tool or a way to collect that information, you can send those rubrics to us and we can put them in here and you can participate in the same system without changing anything about your own evaluation system. And that's not just for building leaders and classroom teachers. That could be for instructional coaches, nurses, um, uh, school psychs, speech pathologist and so on. We have a number of districts who are taking advantage of that, um, that part of this. Uh, we have found um, this year as we started with this, uh, by trial and error, we found that uh, apparently for some uh, reason, I think it's in the cloud, that's the only explanation I can have for it because everything's in the cloud this day, is that Firefox and Chrome 
tend to be better browsers um, in that there are fewer glitches or fewer questions for districts who are using Firefox and Chrome. If you're using Internet Explorer, and there are, ma there are many districts who do use Internet Explorer, check with your local IT people and see if you have a version that's 7.0 or higher. Uh, districts who are using 7.0 uh, are struggling. And again, um, I don't really have an explanation for that. We just know that that's a fact. And once we get in there and help, we've, we've been able to solve a lot of issues um, via this conversation about browsers. Um, Keep to function, uh, one of the functions, uh, we have a data reporting function at the end of this. I know all of you are familiar with the fact that we submit um, Eden Report data, particularly as it pertains to educator performance data uh, and, and a number of other things. And so this system has built in reports that just with a click will gather that information for you. You can get teacher performance level, you can get um, all the information about how teachers have rated themselves in a self-assessment, what their final evaluations were, what growth measures they were using, what cycle they're in, virtually everything that goes into the system, there's a reporting mechanism that's just a simple click. And if you click on, say, the performance rating uh, report, that will generate that report in a matter of seconds, and then right next to that's the tab says, uh, submit to KSDE, which you have to do, and it submits it to us. And so it's, 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 a, it's a great, great function. Um, and none of the data uh, has to do with personally identifiable information. It's all group data and collective data. So um, rest assured that we're not looking at anybody's information. A couple of questions. Um, I logged into, uh, I logged in, but I can't access Keep2. Um, once you log in, you have to be basically um, turned on or uploaded at the district level. Sometimes people forget that. Um, how do you use state assessment as a student growth measure in the evaluation? Right now, you really can't. We have one year of um, state assessment data, and it's just one data point. And what we tell people, this is for the purpose of evaluation only, that until you have four years of state assessment data, only then be, can you begin, begin to make inferences about a body of a teacher's work relative to that state assessment data. We strongly encourage you to find other growth measures that you either commercially purchase, that are commercially purchased, or they're ones that you've developed in your district. Um, some of those that come to mind are, you know, uh, Ames Web and Map, and there's a whole list, and you can see all those on our website. That's where you need to put the emphasis for the time being on looking at. Um, student growth. Um, I won't go ahead with the other questions here other than to answer that no one has access to this data except for the person being evaluated and the person doing the evaluation. The rest of it we can't even see here. There is no cost for any of the training or use of this tool. That's always uh, a nice feature, uh, especially today if you have other fiscal concerns in your district. And that's really about all I have for you today. Please don't hesitate to contact me at this number or this email address uh, if you can help. Also, um, those of you who are uh, Keep Districts know that we've had a little changeover in our department. One of our EPCs uh, has left to open her own business, and we wish her well, but she's not here. So we've got a couple of people double-timing it, but we still uh, will do everything we can to get you um, up and running and, and questions answered as soon as possible. Are you next, Susan? I'm next. All right. This afternoon, I just want to remind you um, of a policy that the State Board adopted in August um, that addresses some of the needs around pre-kindergarten assignments. And you see up on the screen the actual policy. And it's simply an allowance for elementary licensed teachers to be assigned to teach gen ed pre-kindergarten and early childhood licensed teachers to be assigned to teach kindergarten. So you can see some of the points. What does this mean for districts? Obviously, um, flexibility, freeing up or allowing more individuals to be placed in pre-kindergarten assignments. And when this policy references elementary licensed teachers, it does include um, both the K-6 elementary license or 
um, the K to nine elementary license. The early childhood license that's referred to in this is an older endorsement, a gen ed um, early childhood endorsement. And you can distinguish those on a license because they have the grade level attached that's indicated as EC to EC. So it's the older early childhood um, EC to EC. It does not include the older endorsement early childhood handicap because we're talking about general education, early childhood or pre-kindergarten assignments. And for those of you familiar with the course codes and the LPR guide, um, we're talking about the course code 89001. Remember, there's really only two course code choices for early childhood. One is a Gen Ed early childhood code, which is this one. And then there's um, a generic code for early childhood special ed. This does not affect the teacher's license. We're not going to add anything to their license. It just simply means that that teacher will not be flagged or kicked out in the LPR report. Now, I do want to remind everybody also that the Early Childhood Unified, which is our current Early Childhood endorsement, um, either at the birth to K or the birth to grade three level, um, that license already allows those individuals to, to be assigned to pre-kindergarten or kindergarten assignments in both Gen Ed and Special Ed. So the policy that was adopted can be thought of as something that was done as an immediate um, solution or assist in pre-kindergarten needs. Um, but just for your information, there's some future steps that we will be um, starting um, moving towards adoption. The first is that uh, the Professional Standards Board has recommended adjusting the elementary education teacher preparation standards and programs so that that license will carry a pre-K to six rather than a kindergarten to six level um, when individuals come out of those programs. And second, the Standards Board also um, has recommended that we create an add-on endorsement for a general education pre-kindergarten pre uh, that would be simply um, a small series of courses, uh, perhaps, that would allow an elementary teacher that just wants the Gen Ed rather than the more comprehensive Early Childhood <laughs> Unified to actually add that endorsement to their license. If you have any questions, this is my um, information contact. Uh, as always, though, you can contact any of the licensure consultants. Their information is also on our website if you have questions about this or any other licensing issue. And with that, I believe next up is Doug. Thank you. Uh, this afternoon, we wanted to take a little bit of time to talk about uh, our team, Early Childhood Special Education and Title Services. Uh, our vision of creating a single plan that will drive education in your buildings. Um, start with a little bit of history of our team. Uh, we were three or four different teams that were put together over the years. Um, each one of us, we all deal with federal programs and each one of those federal programs seemed to have its own plan that needed to be filed. And so as we started to learn more about each other and, and what our jobs were, we started seeing similarities in what we were asking of the districts. And so we've been moving towards um, trying to get it so that you do one plan that satisfies all of our requirements. And so that's kind of our goal, one team, one plan. Um, as we looked at the commonalities of our different programs, we came to the conclusion that good practice is good practice, and that's what's discussed on this slide, that uh, what's good for all is good for some, or what's good for some is good for all. And so that's where we're headed with one plan. Um, MTSS is, that program also works in conjunction with uh, the EXET team through the TAS and grant, and, and so we're very familiar with that. Um, MTSS feeds into this single plan also because it's looking at the whole student population and then providing uh, specific skills or whatever for um, students that need it, but it's still good practice 
What's good practice for all is good practice for all. Um, next slide kind of talks about in the child and, and the support that they get um, with the child being in the center, teacher in the classroom, building teams, district teams, and then the statewide support that's provided. We also look at the um, self-correcting feedback loop and the Kansas Star Plan, which is what I'm um, here to talk with you today about, that each one of them involves taking a look at your practice, evaluating your practice, making changes, um, collecting data, evaluating, monitoring, and, and so on, so that you continually improve the educational system in your buildings. Which brings us to Kansas Star. Um, Kansas Star is a tool. It's not a program. It's a way to record and keep track of the things that you're doing in your buildings. It's, it's not prescriptive. It, it allows you to take the things that you're doing and, and keep track of them. You can upload different documents to it. Um, all kinds of different things can be put in it from all these different programs. And so we feel like it's, it's really a good program. Um, one of the main tenants of the Kansas Star system is the the work of teams that people can't um, a good program can't operate in isolation that it requires everybody in the building contributing and knowing what's going on and so there's a lot of focus on teamwork just like there is in, in our team here at the agency um, as we talk about Kansas Star the way we got into it was it began in 2012 with the uh, 99 priority and focus schools. Um, they were kind of our guinea pigs in 2012. We started out with basically a hundred and some different indicators and through experience and feedback from the schools that were using it, we've cut, we cut that back to about 54 at this point in time. Um, to make it a little less daunting, but as we've gotten to know the program better, um, we've come to this conclusion that we can use it for all of our different needs. The next couple of slides just kind of show you what an indicator looks like in Kansas Star. Um, I talked about that there's 40, 54 different indicators. Districts choose the ones that they think will have the, the greatest impact on their building the quickest. That's where they start. Um, you evaluate where you're at in the process, and then you develop steps that will allow you to get to where you want to be, and those are the tasks that are involved. Okay. Um, the next few slides talk about the on-watch schools. On-watch schools were the next ones that we brought into the system to start to use Kansas Start. Um, and it's just an explanation of how the on-watch schools were identified. Um, they were given the option of either using Kansas Star or writing out their own plan, and so we had some that went both ways. In the next identification of focus priority on on-watch schools next fall, all will be required to use um, the Kansas Star system. Then. This slide talks about, I talked about the 54 different indicators that divided up into five different uh, categories. You can see those listed at the bottom, leadership, curriculum, instruction, parent um, and community support, and then tiered support, which goes along with our MTSS system. Um, for the on-watch schools, they are required to select an indicator out of each one of those categories. And then this slide that's up there now just um, shows the first two actually go deal with leadership. And then the next ones are out of the other four categories. So if you choose one indicator for each category, that those are the main things that your building is working on at a time. Um, the wise ways are the research behind the indicators that we've chosen. When we narrowed it down to um, from 100 and some down to 54, um, we were looking at 
the things that you can do in your building that have the, the greatest impact, and those are the key indicators. But the wise ways go back and um, is the research behind why those are effective practices. Um, already talked about the next cycle. So after the on watch schools, then the next plan, actually in between that and this, we did put those schools that had to, or that needed to write Title III plans because of not making AMAOs. Uh, those new plans were also put into Kansas Star, so we've added that portion into this. And then the next group that we wanted to bring in were the school wide. Um, this past fall, of the 99 focus and priority schools, 95 of them are school wide, and we had them make the conversion of their school wide plan from a paper and pencil 60 page form into being able to use what they were already doing in Kansas Star as their school wide plan. Then uh, any new districts that are new schools that wanted to become school wide, we uh, the process was for them to receive training and, and put their school wide plan into Kansas Star. And we just completed the first round of trainings in October. We did four regional ones uh, and added about 60 more schools um, to Kansas Star this fall. In Kansas Star, the requirements of a school-wide program, there are 10 different requirements that from the federal government. Three of those are not addressed in the Kansas Star system, and so we do have a supplemental form that goes along with this to help answer those questions. Um, those questions are things that you're probably already doing in your school, so it's not a big deal, but it, it is just a little bit separate piece that has to be done. Um, the next seven requirements then are, are listed there in different categories, but those are the indicators that fit the school-wide requirements. Um, we have the same requirements of our school-wides as we do for the on-watch schools in that they have to, they need to keep one indicator in each of the five categories going at all times, um, showing improvement or changes that they're making to improve their school. That is quickly the Kansas Star System. If you have other questions, um, my contact information is up there and I would be glad to answer them. And I think that wraps up the day, unless Scott would like to say something. Nope. Thank you all. Uh, we have the schedule out, correct, for the next for the next one. Just wanted to remind everyone, we know when the next uh, two weeks, I guess, so December not next 3rd. Wednesday. It will be December 20th. No, that's not. Second. Second. 22nd. December. Second. Just second. Second. Okay. second. December 2nd will be the next. Uh, thank you all. And if you have questions, you, you, one of the advantages of, I think, having faces with the PowerPoints was that you now have a better feel for who folks are. Um, so <laughs> if you see us out and around, curriculum coordinators, various conferences, annual conferences. So don't hesitate, as Brad always says, don't hesitate to call us if you have specific questions, uh, especially in anticipation of the board meeting uh, next week. I know I've received some questions today about the board agenda. Uh, feel free to, to let us know. We'll answer what we can. So thank you.